the report from the National Association of Realtors to report to uh, twice a year, and they do a yearly report also that talks about home markets in the United States. And they make a prediction, and then they come back and say later on how well they did on their prediction. Well, for the first time ever, they missed on 100% of their guesses. So uh, you can look, look back at one of our news you can use for probably the beginning of this year. And I talked about the top 10 projected house markets in the US. At the top was Sacramento, California. Also San Jose, California was in there. Austin, Texas. Um, some other cities like Jacksonville, Florida. None of those made the top 10 list. They, they all got wiped out. In fact, for the first six months of this year, for the first also ever, no big city, in other words, none of the top, I think, 50 largest cities in the country, none of them made the list. And, and as a practical matter, almost none of the second tier cities made the list too. Almost everything uh, that was the hottest real estate markets for the first six months of 2021 we're kind of out of the wood or suburban places. We've talked for about a year and a half now about COVID would drive people from the cities to the suburbs, from the suburbs to the rural areas. And that's exactly what we saw happen. Uh, top market, East Colorado Springs, Colorado. It's not even a suburb of Colorado Springs, but even it's its own small town. Uh, Brentwood, North Carolina. Number two, Medford, Massachusetts. Milford, Massachusetts. I'm sorry, Milford, Massachusetts. Uh, number three, West Iron Dequoit, New York, which is evidently a suburb of Rochester. I think we've got a couple of guys on here from Rochester, New York. Go Rochester. Uh, this is a suburb of Rochester. Manchester, New Hampshire, followed in sixth position by Concord, New Hampshire. Seventh was Lincoln Village, which is a suburb of Columbus, Ohio. Once again, not even Columbus, which is a second tier city made it, but a suburb of a second tier city. Franklin, Tennessee in eighth position, which is a suburb of Nashville. And then the only two that were suburbs of large cities uh, were in ninth and 10th position. Peabody, Massachusetts had the ninth hottest market in the country. It's the suburb of Boston. And Farmingham, Michigan, which is a suburb of Detroit, Michigan. There's only two that were even suburbs of large cities. So the trend continues. I think it's gonna continue for the rest of the year. Uh, look for the action to be in the rural areas and in the nicer suburban areas of mid-level cities, not even outside of big cities. Uh, for example, I'm in right now I'm in El Dorado Hills, which is the county east of Sacramento. Uh, at nighttime, you can look back out here, you can see all of Sacramento and all of the valley, and there's probably a million and a half people that you can see at night. This is a really nice suburbs right up on the edge of the foothills. This would be the kind of city that should make it, uh, but California, they don't generally put these things on there. And you know, because of the pricing, we're not, we don't have enough activity. This study was done, by the way, based on four factors. It was done on affordability. It was done on time on market. It was done on asking price to sales price or sales price to asking price. Um, and it was done on the ratio between the demand and the actual supply of houses. So those were the top 10 hottest markets. Um, I would expect those will be in the strong running for the second half of the year, plus other cities like those and areas like this, El Dorado Hills, California, smaller suburbs of kind of second tier cities uh, to be in. So that's what we got. Hey, Jeff, um, you're the cutting you have a in and off. Uh, you might want to turn off your camera so you don't use too much bandwidth. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now or no? Yeah, a little bit better. All right. There you How go. That? Yep. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, well, hopefully you heard news you can use. <laughs> but we did. Um, <laughs> Does it look, sound a little right, bit more about? Sorry about that. It's not the best area, and we're in the middle of forest fire season here, which is basically all of California on fire. So, um, let's uh, let's see who we've got. I won't be able to see the screen. So, Kevin, you'll have to tell me who got up. I don't see anyone raising their hands up. Um, all right. If you guys have any questions, just hit on the reactions button. 
at the bottom of Zoom, or you could just type in on chat. Yep, go ahead and hit the chat if you don't uh, have a, a, or if you don't find the raise your hand button, which I never know exactly where that's at. Uh, in the meantime, what we're seeing out in the marketplace, uh, a lot of properties that are coming in with seller financing or and or subject to attached to them. Um, we're getting a, a ton of those kinds of properties that we're seeing. We're, we're seeing a lot less uh, cash only offers from sellers. Of course, you still got the sellers that didn't get the memo that you know there are now more product for sale, more houses for sale than there are buyers at this particular moment for what's available out there. But uh, they'll get the message soon because uh, we're seeing still, as we have for the last three or four months, a lot of people come back from longer periods of time ago, like even last year. Brandy, you have this happen to you all the time. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing to generate demand from those leads from 2020 or early 2021. I'm going back and revisiting them, even though they're having a regular follow-up sequence that um, I think we're very fortunate to have in our in-house business, I go back and um, I personally follow up with them. Uh, some of them from maybe acquisitionists that may not be here anymore, or just from leads that are so, how do you put it, so maybe so out of date that they don't get um, a normal, a normal follow-up anymore. And that's been working out really well for me. Um, as far as reaching, you know, those 40 people a day, because the ones who do have houses for sale, they need to get rid of them. Um, and if they still do want all cash, um, they've had their house for sale for so long that they're starting to see maybe that this is the best way to go ahead and get rid of it because it hasn't worked since last year, so it's not going to work now. So a little bit more amenable to listening to terms. Um, even if they're not ready to do a deal sure. yet, they'll be ready to do a deal a lot sooner than later because they need to get rid of their house. It's, it's starting to become a burden, which is what we saw in the deal uh, that we got last week in New Mexico. Absolutely. Keep in mind the things that create a motivated seller, somebody who has to sell for whatever reason are, are the same. Uh, with or without COVID, their death, divorce, taxes, bankruptcy, job loss, medical issues, having to move, uh, and, med and med well, medical issues, of course. Um, these are the same kind of things that happen all the time. People get divorced, they file bankruptcy, they have health issues, everybody dies. Uh, you know, these things never change. And, you know, somebody could actually make an argument that during COVID, some of that stuff actually increased. Uh, so th these are the factors that will drive people to sell at a discount uh, because they're more interested or more concerned about making next month's $719 12 cent payment than they are about walking away from $32,000 in equity. So, you know, you see a lot of those people and we've seen this, I've been through this thing probably three cycles now and it happens the same way. The same way I was taught in the 90s, it's exactly what we're seeing here in the 2020s. Uh, people who are highly motivated are, you know, more concerned about next month's bill than they are about next year's equity. And, you know, people, if they've been in a high equity situation for too long, like we've had a good run now of about 14 years uh, in this market, maybe 15 years, um, it's just, it's too much, uh, so with the exception of the, going back to say seven or eight, starting about nine when we bottomed out and, and then, so I guess about 12 years, but we've had a good long run where people have only enjoyed a lot of equity positions and they became used to and accustomed to just thinking of that equity as real money. It's not, uh, it's, it's phantom. It's like uh, winnings at a card game. If you don't take your money off the table and cash in your chips, it's, it means zero. And so a lot of these people who thought they've got real equity will look one day and see Zillow is now showing in their house is not worth 380000 or 320000 And they'll get really panicked the minute they start seeing the neighbor's houses drop or more neighbor signs on houses in the neighborhood for people wanting to sell. People are going to panic and you'll see a massive run for the exodus. 
And that's when you can really cut some good deals. That's when you're really going to be able to pick up some some decent properties with equity that will last beyond the down cycle and into the next up cycle. So um, keep your eyes open. This is a good time to keep buying. All right.